So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about other aspects of the strategy pattern, looking at the pros and cons and implementation considerations. So some of the nice things about this pattern is it enables much greater flexibility and reuse by strategizing runtime platform IO mechanisms. For example, we can reuse a lot of the code across different variants of our program. I don't really show that in this case, but if you were to look at the Java versions of this, you'd see that in spades. Another nice thing about this is we can change behavior dynamically. So uh, using our tree iterator factory make iterator structure that we have here, we can go ahead and write some code that will let us do an in-order traversal of an expression tree using the technique shown here. And then without changing anything else except the string that we pass in, we can go from in order to post order. And so now all of a sudden we're doing a post order traversal. And so that's going to let us change the behavior to strategize the behavior without breaking the client code. And that's really cool. Of course, there's some downsides. You can end up with a lot of classes and objects that are very simple strategies where you're subclassing something just to add in a few extra details. If you, if you find yourself doing that a lot, then you probably want to use Lambda functions to avoid having to make a whole profusion or explosion of subclasses. And that works great both in C++, it works great in Java, works great in any language that supports Lambda functions, Lambda expressions, and so on and so forth. Another potential downside here is that these calls are obviously dynamically dispatched. So you've got to go through pointers to functions and pointers to V tables. You can't inline the code and so on and so forth. The good news is that modern C++ compilers just optimize the heck out of all this stuff. And so you end up with implementations that are basically as efficient as if you were doing a switch statement or a large if else chain. And if you want to learn more about this, take a look at the link at the bottom of the page that talks about various de-virtualization optimizations that are supported by C++. And it's, it's pretty cool. Lots of good stuff has been implemented over the years to optimize away the overhead of dynamic binding. Another potential downside is inflexible strategy interface. So this is the same kind of problem that we talked about with, with bridge before, where you end up with a one size fits all solution that forces you into the Procrustean bed of uniformity and, and uh, commonality. Not usually the end of the world, of course, you can apply other patterns like adapter or other things, but you can also motivate the need for the context. And that can be used to store additional information that goes above and beyond what's available through the one size fits all interface. So that's a good reason for using context is to get around the one size fits all problem. Another downside is if you have software that's heavily strategized, then if you start having multiple strategies, they may be used in inconsistent ways. So when you combine them, you may end up with something that works well in isolation, but doesn't work well with, when composed with other strategies. So a good example of this is documented in the paper at the link at the bottom of the page, which describes uh, a middleware platform we developed called the ACE Orb, and it's heavily, heavily strategized. Pretty much anything that can vary in the ACE Orb, or, or DAO as we call it, can be strategized. So we can strategize the concurrency model, the synchronization model, the, the multiplexing models, the transport model, the marshalling and demarshalling models, and so on and so forth. And that was all well and good, it made it very flexible, but it was possible for end users to mix and match things inappropriately. And so that was an example of you know, strategy abuse, I guess. And to solve this problem, of course, we, we didn't throw up our hands and stop using strategy, Instead, we applied other patterns, in particular the abstract factory pattern, that allowed us to be able to create semantically consistent strategies. And if you read this paper here, you can find out more about what the problems were and how we solved them. That reminds me, another quick note about patterns. So what is a pattern? A pattern is a solution to a recurring design problem that arises in a particular context. And what you'll see as you start learning about patterns is even though you're in a slightly different context or in a context that's different from the way the pattern is documented, you can still apply that common solution to solve those recurring design problems. So that combination of 
common solution to recurring problem in a particular context is kind of the mantra of patterns. And if you think about it, lots of other things in everyday life have a similar feel to it. So if you are a musician, then you learn certain patterns. They're called scales or chords. And you practice them over and over and over again till you master them. And then it becomes effortless. If you are a chess player, then you study the works of other masters and you read books about openings and closings and mid-game strategies. Those are also patterns. If you're a, a dancer or a martial artist, there's certain things you do when you learn. You practice blocks and kicks and punches or you practice different steps for dancing. And you do this over and over and over again until they become second nature. And all those are examples of patterns that we apply in everyday life. And so it's no surprise that software is the same thing. And master software developers have discovered these common solutions to recurring design problems within the different contexts of the applications that they work in. So just trying to kind of connect the everyday experience with patterns with the software patterns. And it's, it's much the same kind of thing. Some other implementation considerations, how do you exchange information between a strategy and its context? So typically you would have some kind of reference from the context to the strategy or strategies, as well as a reference or pointer from the strategies back up to their enclosing context. That's the easiest way to just go back and forth and, and follow that quickly. Some other interesting considerations, do you want the binding time for your strategies to be static which means at compile time or link time, or do you want them to be dynamic, which means at runtime? So a lot of the stuff we've been talking about in the Gang of Four book kind of focuses on dynamic strategy binding, as we did, for example, with our expression tree processing app. However, there's just as good reasons to use static binding. And in fact, you can think about C++ STL and its support for functors as being a perfect example of a static binding time instantiation of the strategy pattern. So for example, as I show here, where we have a sort algorithm where you can pass in the greater functor or the less functor or whatever functor you want to pass in, that's a good example of static binding of strategy selection. And that's actually been given a, na a name in C++. It's called policy-based design. And that's basically the strategy pattern with just a fancy uh, window dressing around it. In Java, strategies are often implemented with interfaces and factories rather than using the bridge pattern. Uh, so for example, we can kind of see that if you were to look at the Java version of this program, it would go ahead and have an iterator interface for the expression tree, and it would have an iterator factory method that would return a corresponding implementation. And it wouldn't use the bridge pattern at all. Uh, and the reason why we can get away with that in, in Java often is because Java supports built-in garbage collection, so it'll automatically collect unused memory, whereas in C++, it doesn't do that. So we often use the bridge pattern in order to be able to enable uh, automated, well, semi-automated ways of doing garbage collection by keeping track of reference counts. In terms of known uses, there's tons and tons and tons of uses of this pattern. That's why I love it so much. It's just such a common pattern. The uh, middleware that we developed called the Ace Orb has tons of strategy implementations for everything that can change to do it all in a common way. You can read more about that in the link at the bottom of the page. C++, as I mentioned before, has great support for strategy using the comparison functors that are passed into algorithms to guide their behaviors. Similar kind of thing for the predicate algorithms like countif and findif and removeif, all those predicates they all take in functors, which are basically strategies. Java also does this. For example, if you look at the sort algorithm for Java, you can pass in a comparator, and this is basically a comparison strategy. And there's various ways to do this, but with modern versions of Java, you can go ahead and pass in what's called a method reference. And a method reference is just a kind of dynamically bound variant of what you see with STL passing in functors. So it's basically a a functor-like construct that you can pass in, except it's, it's really more of a function or a method reference rather than being an object, but it can be treated in much the same kind of way. So to wrap up this discussion, we use strategy to encapsulate the variability of algorithms with respect to a common API 
and we allow those implementations to be changed transparently with respect to the clients. So the, the best example, of course, here is the use of strategy in the context of our iterators that are created by our iterator factory. And those are strategies that implement different traversal algorithms in an iterative mo uh, model. So long and the short of it, we use strategy very effectively to decouple interfaces from their implementations and allow the client code to remain blissfully unaware as those implementation strategies change. 